Great. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to St. Andrews this morning. Um, yep. Uh, I was going to say if you don't know me, but I think you all know me. But regardless, if you don't know me, my name's Zach, uh, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here this morning. Um, this morning is a special service because uh, we're going to take communion together. Uh, one of the, it's one of the many things that we've been a bit more restricted in doing over the last year or so, um, but it's a great thing to do together. Um, communion isn't just one of those weird things that we do as Christians. Um, it's, it's a regular act that Jesus told his followers to do in remembrance of him and his death for us and in celebration of the new covenant that we can be a part of. By believing and trusting in Jesus, our sins are freely forgiven and we have new life in him. Uh, if you've been with us the last few weeks, you'll know we've been looking at a series of common struggles. Uh, so far, we've looked at anxiety, escapism, anger, and this week we'll be looking at pride, and the issue of pride in our hearts. Um, these aren't easy things to battle. In fact, despite my best efforts, I'd say I've failed in all four of them every day this week. But there's a line in one of the songs that we've been singing uh, that's given me a lot of joy, despite that fact. It says, there's forgiveness for every time I fail. And that's just one of the things that we celebrate as we meet here this morning. So let's pray together as we begin uh, our time. Lord God, thank you that we can meet together this morning and listen to your word. As it challenges us again today, please help us to listen and please encourage us to persevere knowing that our sure and solid hope is found in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to sing that song uh, now. So we're going to stand together. And after that, Sean is going to come and lead us in our prayers. And we're going to stand to sing, Flee from Sin, Run to Jesus. Yeah. 
Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for the teaching we've had recently about common struggles. And we pray that the things we've seen about ourselves and your word would stick with us. Would they help us realize our great need for you to save us and to change us to be more like Jesus rather than trying in our own strength? Today, as we're challenged about our pride, would you help us to be amazed at the humility of Jesus and how he serves us? Transform us inside out through the power of your spirit to love like he loves and to be willing to put others ahead of ourselves. We thank you that we're able to meet together freely at St Andrews and we pray that you would give wisdom to the PCC as they meet tomorrow and think through how to move forward as one united church family. Help them to be able to reach decisions about Sunday services and midweek meetings that look out for the needs of the whole body of Christ so that it would grow and be built up in love and reach out to the people in our community. Heavenly Father, we do not want to take our freedom to meet together or publicly speak about you for granted. Please help us be bold enough to speak about you this week with our friends and family, our neighbours and our work colleagues. We also want to remember those who live in places where it's hard to follow you and ask you to be with our Christian brothers and sisters in Afghanistan, who, because they've stopped being Muslims to trust you, are in even greater danger following the Taliban taking over their country. As they face the fear of being arrested, thrown out of the country or even killed, would you help them know how to keep going and trusting you're with them, even as they pass through the rivers and walk through the fire? Please help charities like Barnabas Fund, who are working in great secrecy and danger, to support our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan. And we pray that you bring justice and soften the hearts of the Taliban, so they would allow Christians to worship you freely and in peace. Finally, Lord, we know that you've promised not to break a bruised reed or snuff out a smouldering wick. You are so gentle and compassionate. Please, with all those who are suffering or struggling at the moment, sustain them, protect them, and enable them to stand and look to you for all they need. We ask all these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Cheers, Sean. Well, we're going to read God's Word together now. Um, If you've got a Bible with you, the passage is Luke 22, verses 19 to 38. If you don't, uh, if you don't have a device that's got a Bible on it, it's going to be on the screen as well so that you can follow along. It's on page 1057 in my Bible, if that helps. So Luke 22, starting at verse 19. Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who's going to betray me with 
is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. Also, a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom, just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my, t- my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned back, Strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the cock crows today, you will deny me, deny three times that you know me. Then Jesus asked him, when I send you without purse, bag or sandals, did you lack everything, anything? Nothing, they answered. He said to them, but now if you have a purse, take it and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. The disciples said, see, Lord, here are two swords. That is enough, he replied. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, Pete's going to come and explain these, those words to us in just a moment and tell us how they help us with our struggle of pride. But we're going to sing together before we do. Uh, this song's really a prayer uh, asking God to change us. And if you're anything like me, uh, that's no bad thing uh, before we hear a talk on these verses and on pride. Uh, so let's stand together and sing and pray, O oh, great God of highest heaven. great God of highest heaven, occupy my lowly heart. Own it all and reign supreme, conquer every rebel power. Let no vice or sin remain that resists your holy war. You have loved and purchased me, make me yours forevermore. I was blinded by my sin, had no ears to hear your voice, did not know your love within, had no taste for heaven's joy. Then your spirit gave me life, opened up your word to me. Through the gospel of your Son, gave me endless hope. Dependent on your grace Keep my heart and guard my soul From the evils that I face You are worthy to be praised With my every thought and deed O great God of highest heaven Glorify your name You are worthy, you are worthy to be praised with my every thought and deed. O great God of highest heaven, glorify your name through me. Well, 
morning, everyone. Let's turn back to Luke uh, chapter 22, verse 19 and following. As you do that, let me lead us in a, in a prayer. Heavenly Father, by your word and through the work of your Holy Spirit, expose our pride and then give us the grace that we need for change. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as Zach has already said, today we continue our series of sermons on common struggles. And the struggle that we're thinking about this morning is pride. Not the kind of pride you feel when your kids or grandkids do something well or achieve something. Now, I'm talking about the pride that we have in ourselves. Let me give us a definition of pride. It's on the screen. Pride is to have an inflated view of self causing me to look down on others and wanting them to look up to me. An inflated view of self, causing me to look down on others and wanting them to look up to me. Well, you might think straight away, I don't do that. I don't really look down on others. I'm not particularly proud of myself. I don't need others to look up to me. But it's more common than you think. It actually is a common struggle. And of course, in its most serious form, It is when we think we know better than God. We have such an inflated view of ourselves that uh, we don't think we need him. It is pride, an inflated view of self, that causes us to reject God and his ways. It's pride that causes us to think, I know best. I don't need to obey that bit of the Bible. My way is right. God is wrong. It is literally the oldest sin in the book. It is pride. That caused Adam and Eve to think that they knew better than God. And it has been an issue for every human being ever since, including all of us. Well, notice with me a couple of things this morning about pride. First, pride wants recognition. Pride wants or demands recognition. We may be quite familiar with the scene in Luke 22. It's the Last Supper when Jesus gave his disciples bread and wine as a symbol of his death for them and as a means to remember it. We still share this symbolic meal today and we're going to do so in about um, 20 minutes or so. But in verse 21, Jesus dropped the bombshell. He said, the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. You can imagine all the disciples sort of sitting there around the table. And as he said that, kind of just quickly whipping their hands off the table and looking around suspiciously at each other. See, there was a a traitor in the room. And verse 23 tells us they began to question among themselves which of them it might be and who would do this. And then verse 24 adds, also a dispute arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. It seems like they wanted to defend themselves, to prove that it couldn't possibly be them who was the traitor. They wanted to present their credentials, maybe, talking about how great they are, as if to say, it couldn't be me. Simon and Andrew might have said, we, we were the first disciples, guys, you'll remember that, won't you? And um, we've been with him the longest, so we're not going to betray him. And Simon might have added... <coughs> And he changed my name to Peter, which means rock. You see, I am the solid, uh, dependable one here. And then John might have said, well, yeah, but I'm one of his best mates, aren't I? I'm in the inner circle. You know, pride is the basis for a lot of ugly behaviours. But one of them is defensiveness, being defensive, wanting to give the impression that you could never act in a certain way. And when you defend yourself, there's often pride at work. I can think of how quickly and instinctively I defend myself, even when there's no real defense. I was in a meeting recently and had forgotten something important. And because I wanted the people there to think well of me, I defended myself and made really stupid excuses. That's pride. Foolish pride. You see... In my heart, like the disciples, I have an inflated view of myself. I want to think I'm great, that I'd never forget something important. I want others to have an inflated view of me too, 
And that means I'll get defensive if ever I sense that they don't. Do you ever get defensive? Even as I say that, you might be thinking, no, not me. No, I don't. I'll let you think about that one. So the disciples are defending themselves by trying to prove their greatness, and it reveals pride. Pride is also seen in demanding or expecting to be served by others. And that's when we think that we have rights and others ought to treat us in a particular way. We probably never say it like this, but it's the kind of attitude that says, don't they know who I am? Harry Maguire, the Manchester United captain, apparently said to Greek police when they arrested him on, on holiday a couple of years ago, don't you know who I am? It's pride that makes us think that we are somehow superior to others and that we should be treated differently. If you knew who I was, you would have a very different attitude to me. The desire to be served by others is also seen in an unwillingness to serve, thinking that some tasks are beneath us. Jesus said to them, verse 25, I'll put it on the screen, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. Normally, those who are in the public eye like the trappings of power and fame. I read recently of some of the outrageous demands, dressing room demands, that certain celebrities have if they go and do a gig somewhere. A number, would you believe, demand a particular colour of curtains in their dressing room, as if they couldn't do their show if the curtains were a different colour. One demands a new toilet seat just for them in every venue that they go to as if they couldn't possibly use one that some lesser mortal has perched on before them. One band wanted a bowl of M&Ms in their dressing room, but with all the brown ones removed, as if they couldn't select a different colour on their own or, or just simply you know, leave the brown ones. The issue is pride. Having an inflated view of self which causes them to lord it over others by making ridiculous demands and wanting to be served. But you know, there is something of this in all of us. Maybe not to that degree, but it is in us all. I'm not going to clean up. I'm not making the tea today. They should make it for me. I'm certainly not washing up. I'm not going to serve in that way. Let someone else do it, someone who is not as important as me. Or at work, I should have got promoted. That promotion was mine, not them. I'm better than they are. Why have they been preferred over me? Well, that's us proudly thinking that we are better and uh, wanting others to look up to us. Don't be like that, says Jesus. Things are to be different in his kingdom. The greatest among you should be like the youngest. And the one who rules like the one who serves. So don't proudly act as if you're the ruler, but humbly as if you're the servant. If we want to be truly great, we need to serve others like Jesus did and not expect to be served. And I'm not just talking about here in church. I'm talking about in our homes, in our homes and at work or when we're at McDonald's or when we see refugees or an asylum seeker, or when we're aware of people who have made a mess of their life through some kind of addiction or mistake. It's easy to look down on others, isn't it? And to think that we're better than them. Oh, they're just clearing tables, or look at the mess they've made of their life. I'm better than that. It's easy in our homes to think we're more important than the kids, and that our, or that our younger brother or sister is uh, less important than us. If we think like that, then we'll expect them to serve us and we'll be less inclined to serve them. Truly godly behaviour has got to start in the home. 
in, in, in private. If it's just when you're out with others or at church, then it's hypocrisy. And it's part of our pride. It's wanting others to look up to us and think we're good. We're just on show. But what are we like when we're in private? In verse 27, Jesus asks an apparently easy question. It's on the screen there. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? Well, yes. That's obvious, isn't it? The person at the table paying for the meal or their guests is normally regarded as more important than the waiter or waitress who is serving the meal. But then Jesus bowls a curveball. It's at the end of verse 27. I'll put it on the screen. He said, but I am among you as one who serves. Now just think about that for a moment. Jesus. He was among them as one who serves. The creator of all things and all people was there serving his creatures. He had literally been waiting on them at the table, serving bread and wine which were symbols of a much greater act of service that he would perform the following day as his body was broken and his blood was shed. This is what true greatness looks like, serving. Not proudly demanding recognition, not proudly wanting others to serve us, but humbly serving, having a genuine concern for the needs of others and not just ourselves. Yeah, we could bless or serve the people cleaning tables at McDonald's, perhaps by thanking them. That doesn't take much, does it? To acknowledge them as people who are, are doing a good job. Thank you for what you're doing. Or clearing our table really well so that it's not a terrible mess for them to, to clear up. And what about other situations when we tend to think that we should be served well? Or where we see people who've made a mess of life? Where do we tend to feel a bit superior do you know, it's been said that the hero in Christ's army is not the person who has rank or title, but the person who is kind to all, tender to all, thoughtful for all, with a hand to help all, and a heart to feel for all. That's who the hero is in Christ's army in the church. So pride demands recognition. It's seen in being defensive and in demanding or expected, expecting to be served. But look at um, what Jesus says in verses 28 to 30, where real greatness comes from. It says this, you are those who have stood by me in trials and I confer on you a kingdom, just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. This is where real greatness comes from. We try to win greatness for ourselves through defensiveness or making demands, wanting people to think we're, we're better than we are or we're worthy. But Jesus says that greatness, real greatness, lasting greatness, is a gift. Jesus says... I will confer on you a kingdom, my kingdom, and you will sit at my table. You see, it's not because of their impressiveness. It's all a gift from him. This is where their real greatness will come from. It's delegated greatness. It's a gift given by the one who is actually greater than any of us and greater than all of us put together. He lets them share what is his you can have my kingdom. You can sit at my table. And that is how it is for all of us who are Christians. Everything we have in life is actually given to us. All our gifts, talents, money, opportunities, looks, whatever you take pride in has been given to you by God. And if everything we have has been given to us, well, there's not a lot of room, none in fact, for personal pride, for demanding recognition. Well, no, of course there isn't, because they're gifts. All the glory belongs to Jesus. 
Where and when do you proudly demand recognition? Sometimes we'll do it very subtly, maybe just dropping into conversation what we've done. Maybe we want recognition for what we do in church or for whatever gifts or skills or achievements we have. Maybe we just think we've done well in life, we've worked hard, we've made the most of things and we're tempted to look down on those whose lives seem dysfunctional or messy. I know that personal pride is an awkward thing to talk about. It's, uh, you know, talking about it is a challenge to our pride. <laughs> we, we proudly want to think we're better than that and that pride isn't an issue for us. But why don't we acknowledge that it is a bit of an issue for us all. It's a bit embarrassing and a bit shameful to say that yeah, I think of myself as better than these people. I look down on them. I've not treated them well. And talk with one another about those times where ugly pride rears its head, knowing that our security is not in us being great, in people thinking well of us, but in Jesus. And when your security is in Jesus, you can be honest about these things. It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks of you. They haven't got to think you're great because Jesus thinks you're great. He, he loves you so much. Personally, I want people to think that I'm a good pastor and a, and a good preacher. Though as I say that, I should say that a lot of this material is not mine. So if it's helpful, don't thank me. Parents are often more concerned with bad behaviour in their children outside of the home. Why? Well, because it reflects on them. And we want people to think we're good parents, that we're in control, that our kids do what we say. Or we might want our house to be perfectly tidy and ordered before we let anyone else in. Now, what is that all about? Is it wanting people to feel comfortable in your home? Or is it so they can see how organised and tidy you are? That's pride. What is it for you? In what ways do you tend to demand recognition? We've seen first that pride wants recognition. Notice secondly, that pride denies weakness. Pride denies weakness. Simon was very often the most vocal of the disciples. He seemed to be the one who would sort of shoot from the hip and speak before thinking. You can imagine that he was at the centre of that dispute about who was the greatest, which is perhaps why Jesus singles him out in verse 31. Just have a look at what Jesus said to him in verse 31. He said to him, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. Sifting wheat was a process of separating good stuff from the bad. The bad was sifted out and Satan wants to sift the disciples, not just Simon, all of them. When Jesus says uh, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, it's plural. He's saying, I'm talking to you, Simon, but it's about all of you. It's all of you. He wants to sift all of you as wheat. He wants to test their faith. And Jesus suggests that Simon is going to make a mess of things, but that he will, in the end, turn back. Now, just look at how Simon responded. It's in verse 33. But he, as Simon, responded, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and death. He's saying, you've got me wrong here, Jesus. I can imagine the other guys falling away, but not me. I'm better than that. Can you hear the pride? I'm better than them. Yeah, I can imagine them messing up here, not me. It's pride that caused Peter to deny his weakness and to think that he's a superhero, but he isn't. It is pride that causes us to deny our weakness, to deny our need for help to think we're better than others. 
It's pride that stops us from talking about our weaknesses. And when we think we can live the Christian life as a lone ranger and not need to share our struggles and the muck of life with others, but again, we are acting proudly. I'll be all right on my own. I've got everything I need. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18 says this, Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. It's a famous proverb, isn't it? It's been slightly shortened, but it comes from the Bible. Pride goes before a fall. Jesus said to Peter, verse 34, I tell you, Peter, before the cock crows today, you will deny me three times. Peter had so underestimated his weakness. And that is what we often do. All because of pride. We think we are better or stronger than we really are. It happens when we start to think that maybe I am not vulnerable to drinking too much. I am not vulnerable to committing adultery. I'm not vulnerable to pornography. I'm not vulnerable to drifting into spending too much time on my phone or my games console or what other, other technology you particularly enjoy. I'm not vulnerable to drifting away from Jesus and I therefore don't need as much support or help as others. Really? Let me tell you, a number of my vicar friends, men who I trained with, are no longer vicars. At least two have committed adultery and another is an alcoholic. Many really good people have fallen in all of these ways and more, perhaps in part because they denied their own weakness. We are all vulnerable. Is there someone you can share your own weaknesses with? The ways in which you are tempted or could be tempted to deny Jesus? If we really want to help one another, if we, we really do need that kind of level of relationship where there can be openness and honesty. Openness and honesty about our weaknesses and our struggles. Maybe a struggle with what we have considered in recent weeks, maybe anxiety or anger or escapism. I have long since stopped being surprised by anything anyone tells me because I know what I'm like. Oh yeah, I'm not surprised by that because I'm usually very similar. Let's not be surprised when people say, I'm struggling with this thing or that thing. Of course they are. For many, there will be moral vulnerability, especially in a world where there is so much immoral content available. We've got to keep talking about that one and being accountable to one another. It's not the only danger out there. Of course it's not. But it is a very significant one, a constantly real and present danger for men and women, young and old. If we don't feel we can be honest with anyone, is that not because of our pride? I'm sure, it would mean someone knowing that we're not as sorted as we might like to present. But that's okay, because the gospel of Jesus Christ gives us the security to speak of our weakness, secure in God's love. And it's as we are honest and bring these things into the open, into the light, have some accountability with others, bring them to the cross, that we're actually making progress and growing in our Christian faith. God loves it when we're honest about our weakness, about our anger and our anxiety and our, ad and our addictions and our mess. Honest conversations are one of the ways we can humbly serve and strengthen one another in the Christian life. As we speak openly and honestly, others will be liberated to do the same. And we can then point each other to our Saviour, to Jesus. 
Are we willing to serve one another by admitting our weakness and abandoning our pride? Serving is greatness in the kingdom of heaven. Do you remember that? That's what Jesus said. If you want to be great, then serve. But not all service is easy. It's not easy to admit our weakness. But even as we do that, we are kind of serving. Pride is in my heart and it's in yours too. There are only two options with it. We can wreck our pride or we can let our pride wreck us. We can wreck our pride or we can let our pride wreck us. How do we wreck our pride? Well, all that the disciples had to do was to look at the table where they were sitting. What was on the table? Just a plate with some leftover bread and a cup with the dregs of wine, both pointing to Jesus' sacrifice to save us from our pride. We like to imagine that we are strong or self-sufficient, but the cross tells us that we're not. It tells us that we're weak and that we need to be rescued. It's funny, isn't it, how we spend so much energy trying to persuade one another that we're worth something, that we're great, when all along Jesus' death on the cross tells us that we're worth everything. We can't come to the Lord's table and understand what Jesus did on the cross and still wonder what we're worth. Nor can we come still denying our weakness. The uh, preacher and pastor John Stott once said this, Nothing in all history cuts us down to size like the cross. At the foot of the cross we shrink to our true size. Live your life there, in the shadow of the cross, and in time it will ruin your pride. I wish I could tell you more of what it feels like to be free from pride. And I would if I'd made more progress myself. But I can and I often do imagine the freedom, the freedom of not having to pretend. The liberty of being honest about my weakness because I'm secure in the unconditional love of the one who matters most. If you're not a Christian, well you need to wreck your pride too. You need to stop playing God. If you think you can run your life better than God, well, then you're suffering from pride. Pride always comes before a, f a fall. I quoted that verse from Proverbs 16 earlier. Another verse in the very same chapter says this, The Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this, they will not go unpunished. But that punishment, that fall need not be yours. When Jesus went to the cross, he took the fall for our pride. He was punished so that we don't have to be. Humble yourself before him and he will gladly raise you up. If you need to do that, if you want to do that, if you want to commit yourself to Jesus, then why not join us today by in receiving bread and wine as a sign of accepting Jesus as your personal Lord and Saviour. And then, well, maybe just let one of us know that you've made that step so that we can help you as you get going as a Christian. Will you pray with me now? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, as we prepare to receive bread and wine, we want to come to the foot of the cross and remember how your son, Jesus, served us so humbly and so completely. Thank you, Lord Jesus. At the cross, we remember our sin and our pride is wrecked. At the cross, we see your grace and we know that we don't have to pretend any longer. Please forgive us of wretched pride. Continue to humble us, moving us to serve others as you have served us, causing us to be less defensive and less demanding. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen. Well, before we share bread and wine, we're going to sing a song that is beautifully honest about what we're like. One line actually says, 
rid us of self-righteousness, the foolishness of pride. Let's stand a sing, Who Are We? Who are we but sinners saved by grace? Guilty of the charge, but acquitted in the case. How can the most holy God allow us to walk free? Jesus paid in full for all our sin at Calvary. by our past Grown to fall But Christ will hold us fast Trusting God while living with the consequence of sin Joyful in our weakness when our eyes are fixed on Him Praise our mighty Savior's name he left his throne on high and came And while we were still sinners He died to set us free Hallelujah, Jesus Christ be praised Who are we but pilgrims passing through? Like a mist And eternity's in view With a soft self-righteousness The foolishness of pride We will boast in nothing But Christ Jesus crucified Praise our mighty Saviour's name He left his throne Still sinners, he died to set us free. Hallelujah, Jesus Christ be praised. Now we sing, united in the fight, justified by faith and righteous in God's sight. Let this local church display this truth for all to see That we were once condemned but now in Jesus Christ we're free Praise our mighty Saviour's name He left His throne on high and came And while we were still sinners notices for us at this stage. First is say that the Bible study notes for October are available from today. There's a pile of them by the door as you leave and they're free and you're welcome to take some with you. Um, tomorrow evening the uh, PCC, that's the church council, is meeting uh, in, in the church centre either in this room or in the side room. We'll pick one of them. And um, so please do pray for the PCC. Uh, tomorrow evening. One of the things we're going to discuss is how and when we can start meeting again at 10.30 as one church family. I've spoken to a number of uh, people already, a number of you already, to see how you're feeling. Um, if I haven't spoken to you yet, if I haven't had a chance to do that, and you have a view on this, then please talk to me after our service today, or feel free to phone me this afternoon or tomorrow, or email me. We're about to move into time of Holy Communion where we share bread and wine to remember what Jesus has done and won for us. And uh, everyone who loves Jesus as their Lord and Saviour is welcome to receive it. Um, we've got grape juice instead of wine for anyone who'd prefer that. And um, as I said, you may want to receive 
communion today as a, an expression of believing in Jesus, even for the first time, if you've not uh, personally done that before. But well, you can. We're going to receive communion in our seats. Myself and Zach will bring the bread and wine to you. And do just say if you'd rather not receive it today. Um, but as we prepare to receive the bread and wine, it's good for us to acknowledge our need for our Saviour, to confess our pride and the other sins that have messed up our lives. So if, you, like me, you are aware of those kind of things, why not join with me in the words of confession coming up next? I'll say the words in light type, and if you'd like to, join with me with the words in bold. God, our Father, we are sorry for our sins, for turning away from you and ignoring your rule. Father, in your mercy, forgive us and help us. For behaving just as we wish without thinking of you. Father, in your mercy, forgive us and help us. For failing you by what we do and think and say. Father, in your mercy, forgive us and help us. For letting ourselves be pulled away from you by temptations and the world around us. Father, in your mercy, forgive us and help us. For sometimes being ashamed of Jesus. Father, in your mercy, forgive us and help us. Please, Father, forgive us by the death of your Son and strengthen us every day to live as your children by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, let me read again Luke 22, verses 19 and 20. And Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So receive this bread and this wine, not because you're strong, but because you're weak. Receive it not because of any goodness of your own gives you a right to receive it, but because you need mercy and help. Receive it because you love the Lord a little and would like to love him more. Receive it not because you are worthy to approach him, but because he died for sinners. Receive it because he loved you and he gave himself for you.
Jesus.